Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome to another review. Up to date I'm going to be looking at another classic Hornby steam locomotive. Today's loco is a little bit special. I'm actually really excited to get this out and see what it's like. It is this, and you can tell already from the outside of the packaging that this is something a bit special because you've got the nameplate going across the top there. Yes, it is the Flying Scotsman in the BR, well, the early BR blue. And that is a bit of a Marmite livery. Some people love it, some people really hate it. Unfortunately, I'm part of the former category. I love this, although then again, there are very few liveries. Uh, in fact, I don't think there are any liveries that I actually actively dislike, so I'm probably not a good judge of these things. I will include a poll on my community tab. Is BR Blue a good livery or a bad livery? You guys let me know. Anyway, I bought this from Derails Models, who is a very good retailer, by the way. It cost me £138.60, I believe, which is quite a discount from the RRP of £179.99. However, there was a very, very big development since I actually purchased this one, and that is that Hornby announced a brand new range of A3 locomotives. I believe they are derived from the very model I have here. They're partly the same tooling, although they have been upgraded quite considerably. So now they have a flickering firebox effect, which sounds really cool. And they're also going to have die-cast running plates, which will obviously add a lot to the weight and quality. Whether or not there are any other upgrades besides those, I'm not entirely sure, but I would certainly hope so because the RRP is much higher there now £209.99 I think which is about £30 higher than the RRP of this and quite frankly this here should have had the die cast running plate given what it cost. Anyway if you're interested in seeing the new A3s that Hornby have announced I do have an affiliate link down in the description but today we're going to be looking at this the current release we will use this I think we'll use this current release to compare to the new one when they do bring those out Hornby that is but today we'll just look at this one find out what this is like and hopefully have a great time with it because I think we've even if you disagree that this livery looks superb and I cannot wait to see it personally. So let's get this out and let's have a look. Yes, the Flying Scotsman, Britain's most famous steam locomotive. In fact, it could be the world's most famous steam locomotive, couldn't it? Not really that well known for appearing in BR Blue like this, although it did appear in BR Blue for a time in real life. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Let me show you the end of the box. Let me show you what version this is. So this is R3627, early BI. It has got the early crest, as you can see. Class A3, it's an A3, not an A1, if you're interested. Flying Scotsman, number 60103. And this comes I believe at a time when that running number was quite new to the Flying Scotsman. Okay, let me show you the back of the box. This was classified as a 7P or a 6F. Unusual to think of the Flying Scotsman hauling freight, although if the back of the box is to be believed, that is something uh, it would have done. In the middle, here you have a brief history. Well, I say brief, it's not at all brief, actually. But either way, if you want to pause and read that, feel free to. And then on the end, you've got this nice little logo that says, live for the journey, not the destination. <laughs> Bugger that. That sounds like something a railway company that is always late would say. Anyway, shall we get this out then and find out what this is like? I've not even had the cover of this box yet, so this really will be my first look at this hopefully beautiful loco. Okay, let's pull it out. And yep, there it is. It sure does look good, doesn't it? Um, the front bogey looks a little bit askew inside there. I hope it hasn't come to any harm inside. But besides that, yeah, it looks really, really lovely. It's in the slightly more normal Hornby packaging now, as you can see, just in the red sleeve. Oh, go on then. Let's get this out. Let's find out exactly what this is like. It's been a very, very long time since I've looked at one of these. And would you believe it, I don't already own a super detailed Hornby Railways Flying Scotsman. The only ones I've got are old trying ones or railroad ones. So this is very, very exciting. I can't believe it's taken this long. Anyway, here we go then. So this is the operating and maintenance instructions for the A1 slash A3. I believe they have similar, if not the same, chassis. There you go, a bit about lubrication, body removal. You do have to remove the speedo if you want to remove the body. Uh, that's something I used to forget and cause damage, so not anymore. DCC ready, this says, yep, you can see the socket is inside the tender. A bit about coal removal and replacement, that's cool. It has removable coal. And then on the back, a bit about brake rods. So that's all the standard housekeeping stuff, isn't it? Right, let's have a look at this baby then, see what this is like. Oh, we have got a bit of an accessory bag on the top, so we'll just take a look at that, I think. 
what's inside here. Okay, so not a great deal. It looks like it's just uh, two things, really. You have the flanged axle that belongs on the rear pony truck of the locomotive. You'd fit that if you have very realistic curves, I suppose. Very, very realistic ones. Mine, forget third radius or fourth or whatever. Or if you wanted to put it up on a static display, you'd probably want those. And then you've got those pre-painted cylinder drain cocks. Besides that, I think that is basically everything. And there appears to be a little bit of instructional material inside there to show you how to fit those. So that is fine. Okay, good, good. That means we can get straight onto the locomotive, which obviously is excellent. Here we go then, Flying Scotsman in BR Blue. Never thought I'd see the day. Oh, look there. Yeah, that is a nice livery, isn't it? Very nice. It isn't quite as glossy as some of the locos I've looked at recently, and there seems to be something a bit wrong with the, the opening air intake on the top of the cab, although it isn't loose. Well, it is loose. It isn't unfitted that's what i meant to say okay well the front bogey is still on the model and speaking of not still connected that is obviously the rear buffer beam from the tender just dropped off immediately without me even touching it how difficult can it be to glue something like that on properly not at all impressed with that and what's the other object uh, yeah that looks like the reversing rod or some sort of rod that has just dropped off again that's not very good, is it? We're not really used to this sort of thing anymore. Back when models were more reasonably priced at sort of sub £100, yeah, this was more acceptable, I suppose. But with RRPs climbing towards, and in most cases now past the £200 mark, this is totally unacceptable, and I'm going to be coming down real hard on this sort of thing. Very poor show from Hornby, that. Okay, well, that's put a dampener on this straight away, which is a pity because I was in a really good mood for this. But the model still looks fantastic, doesn't it? It feels reasonably heavy, although I can tell that the running plate and all of the bodywork, etc., is just made of plastic. Bit of a pity about that, but obviously not a surprise at all. But there we go. Yeah, looks really nice, doesn't it? Lots of detail on there. We'll take a closer look at some of that detail in just a second. But first of all, if anyone's interested, here is a potted history of the Flying Scotsman and also the A1s and A3. So the LNER A3 started life on the Great Northern Railway in 1922 when they were introduced for mainline passenger work by Sir Nigel Gresley and they were built at Doncaster and then of course they were classified as A1 locomotives. The A1 was intended to perform the tasks that the ageing Atlantics of the Great Northern were beginning to struggle with, namely those mainline express services for which more powerful locomotives were quite urgently required. The A1's time with the Great Northern was very short lived though since in 1923 of course grouping occurred and then they became part of the LNER. During the 1920s, Gresley experimented with the class with various modifications to the A1 design, including major changes to the valve gear, new boilers capable of higher pressures, which also had more superheater tubes, and also changes to the cylinders. After all of these modifications, a souped-up version of the A1 was created, and this was reclassified as the A3, as of course we know them now, also known as the Super Pacific, in inverted commas. Over time, all of the A1s were built into this improved design, although it wasn't done particularly quickly, the process wasn't completed until the very end of the 1940s. Of 78 locomotives produced in total, only one of them remains in preservation, and of course it is this one, the most famous of them all, the Flying Scotsman. Scotsman wore this BR blue livery quite briefly from 1949 for five years or so before being painted into one of the more common liveries, which I think was BR green. So there it is then, the Hornby Flying Scotsman, up close and personal for you. And to be perfectly honest, I am a little bit disappointed with this. It doesn't represent the high quality that I've come to expect and enjoy from Hornby over the past few years. It's plastic. Plastic is the word I would use. Cheap plastic at that. Look up close. Look at the sort of grainy texture. And it isn't just the finish that is the problem either. It's also pretty light. I would say it weighs in at 388 grams, which is some 40 grams lighter than the Hornby Railroad Tornado. That is in the railroad range. So it isn't particularly heavy. You can hear the thing creaking when you pick it up. You can feel the parts moving under your fingers, which is really, really worrying. I mean, look at the pony truck casing, for example. It's visibly loose and it moves around when your fingers touch it. You've got parts that don't fit together properly. Look at the banjo dome on top of the boiler and the same is true of other components as well. 
There's also evidence that that broken rod that was off in the packaging was fitted to the right hand side originally, whereas the picture on the front of the box shows it fitted to the left. I would tend to trust the photo on the front of the box, but either way there's been some sort of blunder made there. Incidentally I've decided to fit it onto the left as shown by the picture, but whether that's right or not I'm not sure, but from the manufacturer that is quite a bit of incompetence isn't it? On the plus side there are very few visible glue marks on the model, which on the one hand is great, I'm glad the model looks half decent, but on the other hand if they had have actually used a reasonable amount of glue perhaps some of the various parts would have stayed on the model and I wouldn't have had to repair it straight out of the box, which is a very frustrating thing to do, particularly when you've paid sort of over £130 for a model. So yeah, I'm not dreadfully impressed really, it just feels cheap in the hands. On the plus side, I will say that the running plates are completely straight on mine, I've held my ruler up to them, yet yeah, they do not seem to be curving or warping at all, which is a known issue with these, it isn't just me that has found quality problems with this, in fact some of my other A1 slash A3s from Hornby do exhibit a significantly warped running plate, which perhaps is one reason why they've decided to upgrade the latest release of A3s, so that they do have metal running plates. Well, I think they've got some more upgrades to do besides that, to be honest with you, a flickering firebox is not going to fix this model and it certainly wouldn't make it worth over £200 which is just a little bit silly. It isn't all bad news though, I mean the decoration for instance is generally really good, I say generally because there are one or two areas where it's clearly a little bit sloppy, but overall the lining for example, look at that, the lining is pretty much faultless, I think that looks more, more or less perfect if you ask me. You've got lining on the running plate as well which looks excellent, the side of the cab is also lined and complete with the BR running number, again I wouldn't fault any of that. It is a real shame that the nameplate, the Flying Scotsman nameplate is just made of plastic, for the price an etched nameplate would have gone down really nicely I think because again the finish on that is completely flat it's a completely matte finish and to be honest these days when I pay £140 for a brand new model I do expect things like that to look a bit better. The side of the smoke box has got the builder's plate painted onto there as well I'll try and get a close-up on that so that you can see some of the details there. It must be said that some of the details are really quite good and dare I say it a lot of them are quality for instance in front of the cab here you have the safety valves here which are separately fitted and made of metal so they are one of the few things on the model that actually look like they're made of metal, well, that's because they are. The whistle appears to just be made of plastic, but it is a very tiny fiddly thing, so I think that's fair enough. As we know, the various reversing rods and other mechanical rods are also made of metal, which looks good. It's a pity they didn't stay on the model, but the less said about that, the better, I think. Same thing goes with the valve gear and the running gear, coupling rods, etc. They all look really nice and fine, actually. And of course, they're made of metal too, which looks good. And while we're looking at the wheels, you can see that the axles have been covered over there. And generally speaking, those wheels look fairly realistic, don't they? The smoke box door is nicely finished with the separately fitted lamp bracket, handrail and smoke box dart although the smoke box dart looks a little bit flaccid doesn't it? it looks like it's been squished into the front of the smoke box not so great that you do have the separately applied running number on the board on the front which looks good the front of the running plate is complete with lamp brackets as you can tell we do have screw link couplings pre-fitted to the buffer beams besides the vacuum pipe which is a nice touch and you've got nice realistic looking metal buffers which are sprung there we go take a look at that there's a very ugly seam which goes across the top of the boiler on this locomotive. Now I do think that that is intentional or at least partly intentional because in real life some of the LNER locomotives did have a kind of visible seam on the top. Whether or not the real thing would be quite as egregious as that, I'm not too sure because that really does look like just a plastic parting line, but I am going to give them the benefit of the doubt there because it could well be accurate for all I know, and I've been unable to find a really good quality picture of the Flying Scotsman looking down on it, so that's fair enough. The cab area is very nicely detailed, it must be said, I will admit this, you've got nice flush glazing which looks excellent, you've got the pre-fitted cab doors and the tender floor plate, the tender floor plate looks reasonably rigid as far as I can tell, I'm not able to move that, and frankly I don't want to try in case it breaks, but the point is it doesn't quite meet the tender horizontally or vertically, it's just kind of waving up in the air so there's no real point to it being there. The cab interior though is very, very good, it must be said. You've got all of the gauge details picked out and all of the controls are picked out as well. You can clearly see the reverser and other aspects there. You've even got little seats for the crew to fit in, so if you wanted to get some crew, you could certainly make use of those. And as I already alluded to earlier on, you do have the poseable air intakes on the top of the cab, which of course you can open 
just to let a little bit more light in rather than air, I suppose, which allows you to enjoy the cab detail a little bit better. Okay, let me show you the tender then, because the tender, again, is a very nicely decorated little piece. You can see the pinstriping, the lining, all looks excellent, as does the early British Railways crest in the centre there, which is another faultless tampo print. The coal load inside the tender does look very realistic, it must be said, and the finish is also good and realistic as well. A few of the little pieces of moulded coal inside there just catch the light in a nice way, which makes the thing look really textured and realistic. I like that a lot. The underframe is fairly standard. We've seen this tender quite a few times from Hornby, but as you can see, there's plenty of moulded detail there, and the mould also includes that fine-looking brake rigging, which I quite like. Around the back, you've got lots of details, including those separately fitted handrails, various steps, lamp irons, separately fitted vacuum pipe, and more of those sprung buffers. And around the back, we also have the NEM coupling fitted as well, the tension lock type. So, by no means is this a poorly detailed model, and besides the finish, which I'm not at all keen on, the realism of the model isn't too bad. So I think if it had been assembled a little bit more carefully and built to a higher standard, yeah, maybe this model could be a winner. Whether or not Hornby's latest A3s that they've announced for over £200 will be worth the money is another matter altogether. I suppose we'll have to wait and see. But what is certainly true is that there is a long way to go before they will be worth anywhere near that amount of money. However, I haven't accounted for the performance and the mechanism so far on this locomotive. So I'll take a look at that right now. We'll get the loco down onto the track and we will see how it performs. So there she is, the Hornby Flying Scotsman in the beautiful BR Blue, ready for her first ever test. And while this has been spoiled a little bit by the high price and poor quality, I still think this is going to be a loco that I will really enjoy running because that livery is so special. And also just because the Flying Scotsman simply can't fail to be a head turner, can it? Okay, well, first, before I do test it, and fingers crossed it's gonna work properly, a little word about the mechanism, which generally speaking is quite good. The pickup front is absolutely phenomenal. We have loco and tender pickups. In fact, every single one of the tender's wheels does have a pickup going to it, which means we have seven pickups going to each rail, which, as I say, is absolutely phenomenal. That means this loco should never cut out, as long as the wheels and the track are reasonably clean. This thing should never have any continuity issues with the track. Serviceability isn't quite as good. If you remove the screws on the base keeper plate, you will find that it does become loose, suggesting that you did get all the screws, but you can't pull the base keeper plate off because the pickups are held in place with wires. They don't have the more modern spring-loaded contacts, which allows you to remove the base keeper plate easily for maintenance. Instead, you have to remove the body, take out the motor, loosen out the wires, and then pull the base keeper plate out. Yeah, that's not so good for serviceability, unfortunately. However, I do know from experience that these models are fitted with proper turned metal bearings on each axle, or at least each driving axle, which is really quite decent. Now, removing the body, the, there is a motor, I think, somewhere beneath all of that black tape. Black tape isn't exactly the most confidence instilling solution for wire management, is it? Although, again, it is a solution because there aren't wires all over the place. It is a five-pole motor, as I understand it, but there is no flywheel attached. I think that's another area that I'm hoping the latest Hornby A3 will improve on. I think the gauging is another real area for improvement on these models. I measured on average a back-to-back -back gauge of 14.63 millimeters with a front-to-back gauge of 15.43 millimeters. I normally allow locos, you know, 0.1 millimeter either way, but this is 0.23 millimeters out, which I think is a little bit too tight, unfortunately. So yeah, the gauging isn't perfect. Hopefully it's not so far out that this thing is gonna start struggling or even derailing on curves, but only time will tell. Okay, let's give this a test then. It has not been run in yet, so don't expect the best performance from this right now out of the box. However, I will allow this to run for 30 minutes in each direction before I make a final judgment on the performance so that it's absolutely fair to this loco. But straight out of the box, that being said, let's give it a little bit of power and see how it goes. Let's try the crawl to start with. I'm turning it up, I'm not expecting to see any stalling, or if we do, it's nothing to do with the pickups. All right. So I think that did start inching forwards, but it did stop. Straight out of the box, you can see plenty of cogging there. Again, that's because of the lack of flywheel, but maybe that will go away as the motor brushes get running. Motors will run more efficiently once the brushes are shaped to the shape of the commutator. But straight out of the box, that does at the very least seem pretty controllable. Plenty of slack actually in the coupling rods, which isn't necessarily a good thing, even though I said plenty. You can see the centre driving wheel there starts moving before the rest. Not a huge deal, of course. 
That's very good though. <laughs> it's not all that smooth yet, but I think that's reasonably ex to be expected straight out of the box. Whoa. Mm, that sped up without me touching the controller there and again which suggests that there is a little bit of tension somewhere in the mechanism there's a, a point somewhere in the rotation where something is binding I would say there we are, hands are here, hands are off the controller now hmm yes I mean, I, I'm not going. Like I say, I'm not going to draw a conclusion from that. It isn't terribly impressive out of the box, although it was very slow when it was crawling. How's the medium speed? Whoa, yeah, that really did take some. I don't know. It just seemed to take a while to spin up to speed, even though I turned the controller more or less straight up. But again, hopefully this will all improve with running in. I've not really seen how much lubrication there is on the loco because I couldn't see the axles and such. I hope there's plenty, otherwise I'm running dry, which isn't a good idea. No, already that seems to be getting a little bit better. So what I think I'll do is I will set this forwards, give it 50% speed, and we will start the running in right now. And yes, that speed seems very reasonable, doesn't it? It is, I mean, obviously a fast locomotive in real life, and the 50% speed setting is reasonably speedy, but they haven't gone too far with it, which means that you will still see some decent performance on the lower end of the speed spectrum as well. And of course, given the fact that this is just 50% speed, you can turn that controller right up and get a little bit more out of it if you want to. But yeah, generally, the performance seems very, very good. We will have to wait and see if the slow speed performance improves at all after running in, but I think there's a good chance of that. So only time will tell. I'll come back to you in just a second. Wish me luck. Okay, I am back. And yeah, that was great. That was very issue free. The thing ran very nice and smoothly. I slowed it down quite a lot and let it do a few slower laps. I didn't see any issues on the curbs or on Gordon's Hill. So I'm thinking touch wood, we got away with it on the gauging. Although obviously I would prefer that it was right. The pulling power is okay. I measured a tractive effort of 0.4 Newtons, which should allow this to haul 25 coaches. Yeah, that is okay. It's not quite as beefy as some other locomotives, particularly at this price point and it is easy to see why Hornby have opted to change the running plate on the newest release for a nice metal one, although it doesn't really help people like me who have just spent all that money on cheap plastic. But uh, yeah, not much I can do about that. Anyway, so the slow speed out of the box wasn't that great. There was quite a bit of cogging, although it did get smoother at the higher speeds. Has that changed now that the Loco has been running? I'm turning it up right now. Let's see. Yeah, well... <laughs> Nope, that is still the definition of cogging, isn't it? When you look up cogging in the dictionary, you'll see a picture of this loco from now on in the next edition. Mark my words. Turn it up a bit more. Okay, and that, ooh, sort of, is a little bit smoother. Although, again, something is clearly binding up. Let's switch it backwards. Speed seems to be a little bit different backwards. In fact, it's noticeably not quite as good, is it? Yeah, I'll look at that. So the slow speed is really not dreadfully smooth. Um, it's quite controlled forwards, I must say, better than backwards, but I've seen better, to be honest. Look at that. But it's all right, yeah, it's better than some, isn't it? But I do think that flywheel would have made a difference. Higher speeds, yeah, at that speed it suddenly becomes much smoother and you wouldn't notice that it was binding up at all. Although perhaps it's a bit detectable in reverse there. Yeah, something not quite right with that. But yeah, generally that isn't too bad. At the higher speeds, it is absolutely fine. Look at that. There we go. So mixed feelings again on the performance. It's okay, but it must be said I've seen better crawlers. Okay, so to test that pulling power, we have, let's see, six Pullman coaches set up just behind there. So let's get her coupled to them and check that the couplings work as they should. Oh dear, yeah, it's really struggling in reverse. Look at that, it's almost come to a stop there. Mm. Not very good, not very good, not for the money. <laughs> I don't know, Hornby, I thought we were beyond all this sort of thing, really. The recent releases have been much better, but it's, it's a shame that there are semi-lemons out there. But as you can see, she's handling those coaches all right, so that's something. 
All right, so on the middle line, I have another Pacific. In fact, that's the theme today, so keep an eye out on the layout and see if you can spot any exceptions to that theme. So this one, I think this one's Book Law. There she goes. That is very much a similar model, although it might be an A1, if memory serves. Quite a lot of coaches on that one, just to show that they can do it. They are capable. And then on the inside line, let me bring this one in. This is another Hornby Pacific, completely different model this time. This is the Tornado A1. Uh, much cheaper railroad loco, but it's also much heavier and more powerful, which again is quite puzzling, isn't it? Anyway, enjoy the running session and we shall catch up with the Flying Scotsman and see how she's handling those coaches. All right, let's see how this goes. And to be honest, this is the second lap that it's done now, so I know how it's going to go. And as you can see, it's quite impressive. It handled that curve without any noticeable slowing down. And there's clear, well, it's a, it's a display of torque, isn't it, really, coming up Gordon's Hill here. No noticeable slowing down. And it only speeds up a little bit over on the other side of the room. So the moderate speeds are absolutely fine. It's just such a shame about the slow speed. To be honest, at that price point, it should have been better, shouldn't it? That's just the way it is. Back in 2007 or whenever it was, these locos were released at sort of £100 or less. Yeah, one or two downfalls here and there on the model are to be expected and could be forgiven. But the thing is, if Hornby are going to keep putting up the prices on models like this over the years, they need to improve the model accordingly. It's great that Hornby are improving them now with the Flicker firebox and the die-cast running plates, but that doesn't make their current A3s much better, does it? And at the moment, those are the ones I'm stuck with. So mixed feelings about this one, really. It is a shame that it wasn't a little bit better. I really had hoped it would be better. But again, it's just the price, isn't it? I could have overlooked a lot of this stuff if it was £100 or less, but you know, I paid the best part of 140 Yeah, there's no room for these issues. Absolutely no room. It's all right, though. It's a lovely looking loco. And I'm really going to enjoy seeing it run, and the valve gear just looks amazing as it runs. Yeah, there's a lot of good in this model, but there's also a lot of mediocre too. Hopefully, Hornby will change that. So let's have some ratings for the Hornby A3 Flying Scotsman. The level of detail then, I have given four and a half stars. Now I have made quite a few criticisms about this locomotive, but I think looking at the level of detail in isolation, the model is really quite impressive. I mean, you've got that fantastic cab with all the gauges picked out, that's marvelous. You've got the sprung buffers, the decoration, which was absolutely wonderful, and all of those metal details as well, metal safety valves, metal reversing rods. They're really, really nice touches. I have just knocked off half a star for the finish because there's just something plasticky about the way that boiler doesn't sheen the way that other more modern releases do but the level of detail yet yeah, generally is quite impressive performance then yep yeah, the performance is all right at the higher speeds it's absolutely fine in fact better than fine it's quite good on gordon's hill and all the second radius curves and such However, the slow speed really does let it down, to the point where I've actually knocked off two stars for the slow speed and not just one, as I usually do. Yes, it's cogging at the slow speeds, it's not very smooth, and the valve gear and the coupling rods appear to be binding at certain positions. Really, I think for what I paid for this, it should have been much better. I'm a bit disappointed in that. The pulling power is okay. I measured 25 coaches as a result of its tractive effort of 0.4 newtons. I mean, it's about right, it's not too bad. However, it is much less than the Hornby Railroad Tornado, and the Hornby Railways Britannia. Those are similarly sized locomotives though and the Britannia is of a similar price too so yeah the power isn't absolutely wonderful but it's more than adequate I would say. The mechanism similarly is overall really really good. I've given it four stars all wheel pickup except for the pony and front bogey which is fairly standard. Proper bearings on the wheel set, five pole motor all really really nicely designed. No flywheel so I can't give it five star but yeah overall the mechanism is very good. The quality it's had to lose two stars. First of all all of that plastic construction, plastic running plate, plastic body, plastic, 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 and it looks it as well. Also, the model wasn't put together very nicely. I've got bits dropping off it, details fitted, I suspect, in the wrong places, and then you've got the parts that don't fit together properly, so it loses another star for that. Yeah, this one does feel a little bit on the cheap side, which is puzzling given the next category, that is, of course, value for money. With an RRP of £179.99, this model should really have been better. It should have a little bit more metal work. It should have had that flywheel. It should have looked a little bit more like the real thing does in terms of its finish. But at some retailers, these are available at a bit of a better price. I paid £138.60 at D-Rails Models. Thank you very much for that D-Rails Models. Good price there. But either way, yeah, it's still quite a lot of money, so I've given it three stars. 
Overall then, that is a reasonably mediocre score, I suppose, of 7.14 out of 10. I had expected this to be better, but I've demonstrated quite clearly that it was not. So into the logbook it goes then. There it is, fifth, just above the Busy B James and below the Web Coal Tank. Yeah, not as good as I was hoping, but overall not too bad, particularly on the performance front. Rested. So if, like me, you're interested in the latest Hornby A3, the updated version, that is, uh, I do have affiliate links down in the description. There are a number of different versions available. I think there's four, all of them in different liveries. So like I say, if you are interested, do go and check those out. I think my conclusion today is that any updates that Hornby are planning for their A3s are much needed, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what they've been able to do with this uh, slightly older model now. I think 2007 is the right date, somewhere around there. Yeah, they are starting to show their age a little bit, aren't they? Anyway, yeah, I'm sorry if this review has made me sound a bit grumpy. <laughs> it's not me, though, I promise. It's these uh, manufacturers. But hopefully, once some of these new models for the year start coming out, I'll have some sort of more modern locos to show you. And hopefully, in comparison, they will look and perform quite a lot better. But I hope you enjoyed this review. Thank you so much for joining me for yet another. And I'll see you again very soon for some more new videos. So you look after yourselves, folks, and I'll catch you very, very soon. All right. Cheers, everybody.